Welcome back. In the last lecture, we learned the definitions and the concept behind sampling. Many of you may be involved in conducting studies in real time, and you will know that most times you won't have the resources to study the entire population. You'll need to draw a sample from the population and then project the results from the sample back to the population. So in this lecture, we will study the various sampling techniques and types of sample. We will actually learn how to draw the sample from the population. Sampling techniques. Broadly, we have non-probability samples and probability samples. Mostly, we would like to have probability samples. Before we delve into probability samples, let us briefly discuss non-probability samples and understand some of the limitations of it. That will set us up for probability samples or random samples. In a non-probability sample, your chance of selection into the sample is unknown. Non-probability sampling or non-random sampling is usually done when random samples are, for one reason or the other, not possible or difficult to obtain. All right, volunteer sample. So volunteer sample is a type of non-probability sample. Suppose we want to know the opinion of all the university students regarding gender equality. To determine this, if you circulate a gender equality survey in the university's weekly newsletter, it is possible that a large majority of the survey respondents will be those who hold strong opinion on the subject. This is a volunteer sample since the participants selected themselves into the study. It could yield a biased result and the bias could be in any direction. Okay, that is volunteer sample. Now what is convenient sample? Okay, for the same question on gender equality, if you stand outside the School of Public Health building and distribute surveys to those passing by, this can be described as a convenient sample. The individuals enrolled into the survey simply happen to be present at a time and place convenient to the investigator. You may end up enrolling mostly public health students and miss students from other majors who may be on the other side of the campus and share views different from the public health students. So, convenient samples run the risk of selecting or deselecting certain groups of individuals into the survey, leading to a selection bias. Your Practice of Survey Research textbook has a good example of convenience sampling commonly used at shopping malls. In certain occasions, volunteer samples can be thought of as a form of con convenience sample. Okay, what is quota sampling? Well, quota sampling is a convenience sampling, but here you set quotas on the type of individuals enrolled into the sample. For example, in a gender equality survey, you can set quotas to the students enrolled into the survey. For example, you can set it as 25% public health students, 25% humanities students, 25% engineering students, and 25% music students. So, quota sampling brings variation in the sample that reflects the target population somewhat better than a simple convenient sample. Okay, what is snowball sampling? So this is known as chain sampling or chain referral sampling. It is a strategy to sample populations that are hard to find and smaller in number and more difficult to locate. Homeless people are a very good example of snowball sampling where one homeless refers the researcher to another homeless and so on. Uh, in a similar note, response-driven sampling, it is a variation of snowball sampling in which you increase the participation rate by providing incentives to both members who make the referral and receive the referral. So it is similar to snowball sampling, but here you give incentives. And the improved participation rate helps reduce selection bias. Now with quota sampling, snowball sampling, and response-driven sampling, the results are more precise as compared to convenient samples. The non-probability samples are useful for pilot testing, generating hypotheses, and generating cases for qualitative research. So that is our non-probability sampling. Let us now look at probability samples. Probability samples are random samples. Here, each individual or group from the sampling frame is randomly selected with a known non-zero probability. For a probability sample, 
you need to be able to create a sampling frame, a list of all population members. But know that many times such lists do not exist, and it can be very expensive to create a sampling frame or a frame list. You are lucky if you come across an existing sampling frame. We will talk about four types of random samples. A simple random sample, systematic random sample, stratified random sample, and cluster sample. First, let us look at simple random sample. In a simple random sample, each individual from the sampling frame has an equal probability of getting selected into the sample. It can also be referred to as equal probability sample. The sampling unit is at the level of the individual. You can obtain a simple random sample by assigning random numbers generated from a random number generator to individuals in the sampling frame. You can calculate mean from a simple random sample using this formula that I have given. It's just like how you calculate a mean usually. Again, having a sampling frame is necessary for being able to take a simple random sample. And many times, as I said in the previous slide, this is not possible. It is usually easier to create a sampling frame for smaller and findable populations. Okay, in systematic sampling, you select every kth element out of the population. You begin with a random start in your list. You determine the k by dividing the sample by the population. If our population size is 10,000 and sample size is 100, then k would be 100. Starting from a random start point, we then systematically select every 100th individual from our frame population of 10,000. If we randomly start at individual number 2, then the next consecutive selections would be individual numbers 2 plus k, which would be 102, 102 plus k, which would be 202, 202 plus k, which would be 302, and so on. If your frame population is organized into groups, then a systematic sampling can automatically give you a stratified sample. So time and effort-wise, systematic sampling can be more efficient than simple random sampling and stratified sampling. However, in systematic sampling, you must take care to examine well our frame population and examine well also the sample that is being generated and make sure that all the kth elements that you are selecting from the sampling frame are somehow not structurally related, that is having some common attributes. This may not be common but can occur. Your practice of survey research textbook has one such example on page 136. In stratified sampling, the population is divided into strata from which we take simple random samples. Say we want to conduct a survey to study the ibuprofen prescription behavior among physicians at Kaiser Hospital. If you want a sample of 800 physicians and there are 50 clinical specialties at the Kaiser, then we randomly select 16 physicians from each of the 50 specialties to get to a sample of 800 physicians. Here our clinical specialty is the strata. Do not confuse this with cluster sampling. In a cluster sampling, we randomly select a given number of clinical specialties and then study individuals from the selected clusters. In this example, stratified sampling appears to make more sense as it will give us a more representative sample of physicians across all the disciplines whereas cluster sampling will tell us the prescription behavior only in the selected specialties. It really depends upon your study question which sampling method you want to use. If you want to study the handedness of physicians at Kaiser, then probably cluster samples are okay. Clinical specialty should have no influence over whether physician is right-handed or left-handed, whereas a prescription behavior could be very much influenced by clinical specialty. Alright, this brings us to cluster sample. In a cluster sample, instead of individuals, groups or clusters of individuals are randomly selected. Villages, schools, classrooms, etc. they are all clusters. Randomness is at the level of the cluster. 
we sample clusters mainly because of cost. It can get prohibitively expensive in terms of the time, travel and the effort to take simple random samples in many cases and where a sampling frame does not exist, simply creating one can be too costly. For example, let's say we want to know the mean body weight of nurses across the state of California. Rather than trying to create a sampling frame by generating a list of all the nurses in the state, it may be much easier to randomly select n number of hospitals and then study nurses from these hospitals. You can conceive of cluster sampling as similar to simple random sampling except that the sampling unit is a cluster. You can conceive of cluster sampling as similar to simple random sampling except that the sampling unit is a cluster instead of an element. Here in cluster sampling probability is assigned to cluster instead of an individual. But keep in mind that when sampling unit is a cluster, the sampling variance tend to, tends to increase. Hence, the precision of the estimate drops. So this is a drawback of cluster sampling. We will see in the next lecture how the sampling variance increases in cluster sampling. Alright, thank you.